assignment and job in the private sector was working on feasibility studies for nuclear power plants. And today, what I'm doing as part of our family business is basically sometimes I, I simplify, I say we make baguettes and croissants. So in between, between nuclear power plants and baguettes and croissants, I have pretty much done everything. And it's not exaggerated. I have been working in 64 different countries. Today, um, it, it is, and I think that's the subject of our conversation, it's about l'opera. L'opera, which is a boulangerie, patisserie, salon de thé, the last of six ventures, startups, that I have been involved in. Area of activity is India. For the time being, uh, we are uh, we have concentrated on the capital region of Delhi. But as you know, it's already 25, 26 million people. Also, we have one pilot operation a couple of hundred kilometers away. Uh, we wanted to know how you can operate at a remote location. The very first one, the first one was uh, a company I created in, in Khartoum, in Sudan. I was there on behalf uh, of the World Bank on a mission. I got to know a wonderful gentleman who was representing the Sudan uh, at the Human Rights Commission. And this gentleman who was a former Supreme Judge in the Sudan. He said, Kazem, you have to bring the creativity you have to start activities in the Sudan, we need your, your experience, etc. So I left a wonderful, secure job, and then we started uh, creating some small-scale industries. And at that time, very young, idealist, which I hope I have kept some of it still, where we thought it's not okay to come and you don't exploit a developing country. So we said, okay, we will do something. We will create industries, bring equipment investment from outside, but then Sudan had wonderful also natural products like mangoes and limes, etc. So we will export. At, at that time, I thought the trade has to be balanced. So we started by creating a number of small scale industries in, in the area of furniture manufacture, in the area of food and beverage. We created some activities, a small bakery. So that was the very first startup. But I must say, I said I was involved in six startups, but not all of them were successes. What happened is that a couple of years into that activity, uh, there was a political upheaval. The system uh, changed and many people were even killed. And I just took a briefcase with my passport. I went to the airport, caught the first plane out of Khartoum. And it took me 10 years to pay back the debt I had incurred. <laughs> from the banks to do my first startup. So that's where it started. Now, the second one, it was with uh, three other engineers. Uh, that one was now high tech, absolutely high tech. I am happy to say we were the first company to create digital printing for the printing industry. We created the very, very first digital printers. And believe it or not, the product it was used to print barcodes to mark cows and cattle in the United States. So the first cattle which were carrying a barcode when they were moving from one state to the other, they were printed by a company uh, that we created in east of Switzerland in St. Gallo. That was also didn't have a very happy ending because in the recession of 1992, we were young, we were 40 people, half of them were PhD or engineers, very high tech. We didn't fire anybody. We thought it's not nice to fire. 
So we said, oh, we will survive the recession, but we needed more and more funds. Orders did not come as we expected. So the banks took over. That company is a big success now, but unfortunately doesn't belong to us anymore. But luckily from the third one onwards, they were more successful <laughs> ventures. So as you see, first one, very, very basic startup activities in Africa. Second one, high tech in Switzerland. And then I went to the graphic arts industry. And then there was another startup, which was in the field of medical devices. And that company was a great success. It was called uh, Given Imaging. These were small pills that you swallow, but they are cameras. They showed the content of your small bowel and your colon. And this company was then sold uh, for $1 billion to another company, which was called Covidian. And it, luckily I had some uh, stock options and the, whatever I earned, I invested in L'Opera, which is our current venture. So you see, they are somehow related to each other. <laughs> always love to create something from nothing. So this is this is really like a passion. And this can be in all areas of life. It's not necessarily just in, in business. The idea of L'Opera, what we do, was not mine. That was our son's idea. And he had this idea when he was very young. He was um, 23, 24 years old. And he had come to India as part of his internship before his graduation. He had to spend six months uh, overseas. And during this period, he was looking around, he was looking for good French croissants, baguettes and pastries, etc. And he said, well, there were some, but they were really not very authentic. They were only in five-star hotels. There was no culture of salon de thé or, or coffee and good bakery and pastry on high street. And then he said, why don't we do that? And it took uh, 18 months. He was the driving force. And then we supported him and we brought the experience of how you start a venture, how you prepare a business plan, how you do market study, how you go about. So all those five other startups I had done before came here. And at that time, I was still the president for another startup in Asia Pacific and Japan. So for me, that was something I was doing uh, on top of everything else. So at the initial phases, it was a common undertaking of all of us. There is no ideal place for business anywhere in the world. Every country has uh, some positive sides, have some strengths, some weaknesses, uh, some, um, some desirable values, some other things that you want to avoid. So it is a question, if I can say, as far as I'm concerned, the experience of these 60 plus countries, they, uh, they taught me how to appreciate whatever is there and how to overcome difficulties and challenges that are there also. Now, uh, one of the things which was very unique uh, when we started L'Opera, we did not just start a business venture with the objective of having a rapid return on investment. It was a very unique situation that like a country which is 1.3 billion people, there was no established brand in the field of uh, bakery and pastry. And I believe one of the reasons was that the people who had created similar things or ideas, they had only a short-term view. We said, we want to do something which will stay here for generations with or without us. So that was the premise of creating uh, the business. The second thing, we said, we don't want just to take financial return. So we formulated from the onset, eight values around which we were creating the company. And this year it's our 10th anniversary. We have added two additional values. So they have become 10 core values. But it has 
consequences. You know, when you create values and you don't take it just to frame it and put it on a wall, it has huge consequences. It comes at a cost. So at the top of our values was excellence and quality. Then we have uh, other values like truthfulness, honesty. We have values like gender equality. We have values like meritocracy in a, com in a country where you may have other ways of advancing due to your background, age, religion, I don't know, in India, caste or whatever it is. Uh, we had other values like transparency, like cooperation. We were committed to uh, sustainable development. And the two last values we added was consultation, which is different from just cooperation. And the 10th value we added was the notion of service. So these values, they, they had consequences. They had really and still have consequences. But I can say the fact that we are here after 10 years is that some of those consequences were very positive. <laughs> and uh, today, with, or you can, nowadays, I cannot tell you something you cannot check on the internet. We are the most respected brand in our field. Uh, I don't want to say we are the most profitable brand, probably we are not, but we are the most respected, we are the most known. We are the most trusted brand. And year after year, every year we have been publicly recognized and we have been awarded with different awards in recognition of what we have achieved. You have to have a USP. If you don't have something which is unique, then then you cannot compete, particularly you come as Frenchmen to a country like India who, who, who teaches everything to the rest of the world. Look how many Indians are CEOs of world companies. And now we come, French people, no background in bakery and pastry, and we want to do something. So we had to look, we said, what, what can we do which is different? So we said, okay, here there are many undertakings but let's do something. Nobody has been consistent and has given quality and excellence. People will recognize, they say you have done the same quality. You have been excelling over the years. You did not start to cut corners. You, you have been innovating. You have been bringing new products. You have improved the way you are treating your customers, etc. So this excellence and quality, it is really, absolutely essential to what we have been doing. We, we have, for example, our commitment to gender equality. Our senior management meeting, which is a management meeting every week, 50% are women. We have when people who attend our meeting are female, are women. So this question of gender equality, we live it. It's true, it's real. Now going back, to the first one, which was quality and excellence. It had, it had consequences. You see, in a market, you cannot just go and say, oh, I have high quality, I am for all excellence. I will sell the products 10 times more expensive or twice as expensive. There are market prices. If you price yourself out of the market, you're out. So it meant that you had much smaller margins because you want to put quality ingredients. You want to pay uh, staff that treats the customers the way they should do. So you are not paying, underpaying your staff. You are not buying cheap products and ingredients. So your return on your investment, the period of your return of your investment will be longer. So you have to be patient. So it has consequences. These values, if you take them seriously, have consequences. This is what I can share also with existing or new EVVF uh, members. I don't want to say it's easy. It is one thing. It is one thing speaking about concepts and principles. The other thing is, 
putting them in practice and living. Not all your shareholders will agree with you. You will come under questioning. You will come under pressure. If you, unless if you are, you have so many resources, you can decide and do everything yourself. You don't care, which is also not the purpose, because then you deprive yourself of the contribution and uh, uh, opinion of the others. So I really never wished, even if I had all resources, I would have wanted people to say where I'm going wrong or when the company is going wrong. Otherwise, you make huge mistakes, but it has consequences. Some people, they didn't have the patience to let quality and excellence show its value. After a few years, they wanted to cash out. I, that's the reality of our economic uh, uh, system. So just to say that these values around which you build a co company, they, they have consequences. And you can probably, and this is one of the things, one of the reasons I'm a member of EBBF, to see where we find this secret and magic formula, if at all, how you can say and respect all these principles, be ethical, be long-term, sustainable, and all of these things, do the, and then still uh, be the most profitable company and be the top uh, the, in the, 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 your sh share prices will go up, etc. Probably that is not the case, with exceptions, exceptions, unless you happen to have all those qualities and be a genius of having discovered something nobody else has. This is more personal. Nothing that I have done would have been possible with, without the support and understanding of Christine, my wife. When we, uh, when we got married, it was not just getting married, attraction between a man and a woman. We shared ideas. We shared our faith. We, and we did everything together. And when I say everything is everything. At times, I sacrificed to support the activities of Christine. At other times, Christine sacrificed to support my activities. But by doing so, both of us, we had a lot of fun. <laughs> it was fantastic. So I must say it would be wrong to get the impression that me or Laurent or Christine, any one of us, and also Caroline, our daughter, who has just started her own startup, which is an educational um, program called GEM. This is not something you do alone. Unless you have this support system close, like your wife or husband, and then extend it and the children and people around you, it will never be possible. Uh, the three wonderful people who were the co-founders of, uh, 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 of EBBF, George, uh, Daniel, and Ezad, those were wonderful people. Look, look what visionaries. EBBF has been a great inspiration. I don't need to say how fantastic it was. It, it's recognition uh, at business school, it's uh, participation in international fora. And more than that, it's the commitment of the individuals who, who share their experience and who want to build a better future. I mean, it is part of the name. So I, I am emotionally and practically, I only wished I had more time and I could support EVBF more than what I do now. I very often ask myself, do I want not to have done the mistakes I have done? Because mistakes I have done plenty and I still do it plenty every day. But it's thanks to those mistakes and experiences that you become mature. If you don't have that, you, you, are, you will never mature. So those are not the things I would like to change. Was it wise to go to Sudan, a developing country, invest half a million dollars, which was a lot of money at that time? Uh, yes, but I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot.
would you have wanted to fire everybody as soon as recession came in, but then uh, you would have not been kind-hearted, etc. So, but now, yes, there are things. Perhaps uh, I should have become uh, more moderate in my views earlier. <laughs> I would have said to the younger cousin, be more patient. Don't jump to conclusions too early. Leave more time for questions to mature. If I would have been a little wiser earlier, <laughs> and even now, then perhaps we could have done things better. So that's the advice I would give. I will not tell any young people don't do crazy things because until unless we do crazy things and unless we innovate, unless we dare, then nothing happens. The distant future is certainly, it certainly looks good. Because if you look, if you judge by the history of mankind, we, we have made progress. Let's forget this uh, bracket, which is now the pandemic. Uh, the, the worldwide, we, we have more collaboration, we have more exchange, we have eliminated a lot of diseases. That there are no, there have not been major wars for some time. I mean, the, the list is very long of those things. But at the same time, we have also these challenges like. Uh, on the top of the list is obviously the deterioration, environmental issues, what we are doing to the environment. We have, unfortunately, now we have inequalities which are increasing. So those problems also exist. Now, how I see the future and what I, how I would like to see the future, and which is going to be probably, we will all want to see a future where justice prevails. I would say the first thing is justice. And this justice can be in all areas. It can be uh, social justice. It can be economic justice because then everybody will be happier. Now, I also know that it's not just by wishing or having nice theories that this can happen. So you have to start somewhere. If we want to change, it is painful. Every change is painful. It needs sacrifice. It needs accepting that some things will not be as as maximalistic as you wish. We would like to make our small contribution. You know, in the 10 years of our history, we have trained 600 people at L'Opera. This is our contribution to the future. We trained 600 people in the different uh, uh, the, the traits of bakery, pastry, and hospitality industry. This is a capital. Uh, yes, nobody likes competition, but there have been at least a dozen companies who were created uh, following our lead. They do try to compete with us, but we have to run faster. <laughs> so, but, but we created, imagine how many jobs in India, and typically in India, every, um, uh, every salary earner supports 10 people trying to share these values, not only share, to live these values, live these values. And it's painful, I assure you, there are many shortcuts we can take. So how I would like to see the future, is I explain. Now, how I see getting there, it's going to be thorny, it's going to be difficult, it's going to be bumpy, but we need people like members of EBBF who dare who both in theory and practice are willing to build and create this future.